Hey, thanks for joining us, everyone. The purpose of this talk is to better familiarize and educate those that are interested in energy funders. So what do we do? Who are we? And some of the nuances to private market oil and gas investing. I'm Sage Whelan, your host, and I'm joined by three of our lovely teammates, Jeff, Laura, and Ginny. Laura, would you like to kick us off? Sure, I'll kick us off. I think one of the things that we've talked about a lot lately is making sure that our investors understand our individual backgrounds and, and more or less what qualifies us to be making these investment decisions on your behalf. So what we'd like to do is go through each of our individual backgrounds, kind of talk about where we came from, why we're here, all of those sorts of things to give you a better idea of, again, what qualifies us to be doing what we're doing. Uh, once we do that, I think I'd like to go ahead and start to talk a little bit about how Ginny and I make our, our selections, our, our, uh, our selections for the funds, which assets we're looking at, what our process is generally. And then once we get through that, I think then we will follow up with what the current fund looks like, why we've chosen to, um, to build the fund the way that we have built it out. And we will give you an idea of kind of what the plan is point forward with that specific fund and other products that we may bring out later in the year or early next year. So I'll get us started. Um, I'm Laura Palmer. I'm the CEO of Energy Funders. I am a geologist by background and training. I was born and raised in Boulder, Colorado, which is a great place to learn where to be, how to be a geologist. Very beautiful place. Um, I attended the University of Colorado for my undergrad, which actually incidentally is how I met Jeff. Uh, well, secondarily to how I met Jeff, but anyway. Um, studied geology and actually I was also a pre-med major, which is kind of a funny thing. Um, ended up being very good at geology. My uncle is a geologist and so he suggested that while I was taking some of my courses that I get an internship. So I started interning as a petroleum geologist when I was probably about 18 years old. So I've been doing this a very long time. Um, I don't want to say how long, but about 20 years. Um, so I started interning at a small company in Boulder um, that was trying to build an analog to uh, one of the super major oil and gas fields called the Cantrell field. They were saying that there's a field in the Bahamas that was very, very similar to that. And I was just a baby geologist. So I was digitizing things and trying to improve their core descriptions and stuff like that. But it's really when I got hooked on oil and gas because you know, there were two directions you can go with a geology career. You can be in more or less environmental or you can go petroleum. That's kind of your, your two choices. So did that for a while, had a couple more internships at other uh, major oil and gas companies, and then went to work for Whiting, or sorry, Williams Production, where I did actually meet Jeff, who had also gone to CU Boulder. So at Williams, I was in charge of operations geology in the Peons Basin, which is no longer quite as active as it once was. When I started, we were chasing 21 rigs across the Peons Basin. Uh, that was in 2008, price crashed. And so we went from 21 rigs when I started to about four rigs when I was about six months into my first real job. So that was my first uh, big experience in the ups and the downs of oil and gas. After that, you know, I, I enjoyed the operations stuff, but I kept seeing other geologists get to do more interesting things than I was doing. So I decided to go back and get my master's degree. Um, I had applied at a number of different programs, but I ended up at the University of Texas, Hookham, which is one of the best petroleum geology schools in the country, if not the best, I would argue, um, and studied there for two, two and a half years, uh, specifically studying natural fracture systems. This is totally nerdy and nobody really needs to know it, but I'll, I'll go into it a little bit. Natural fracture patterns in the Marcellus Shale which at the time was kind of one of the more up and coming shale basins that people were starting to explore a little bit more or develop, I suppose, at the time. Subsequent to that, I was hired on at Anadarko Petroleum Company, which is now owned by Oxy. Uh, initially, they put me in Marcellus operations. So I was drilling, I think I drilled somewhere on the order of 10 to 20 horizontal wells in the Marcellus Shale. So at the time we were geosteering our own wells, planning our own wells, doing everything soup to nuts for all of the planning and development and mapping. Great experience. Um, eventually <laughs> Anadarko decided that I would be better suited for an exploration role, which is really, it, it ended up being a really good fit because I am a little bit more creative and ended up looking at almost every single basin in the onshore United States for primarily horizontal potential, but also conventional potential or vertical wells. Um, that was a very, very good experience for me. I became very quick at deal evaluation. And after that experience, they moved me into the, um, 
into the Delaware Basin Exploration Business Development Unit, more or less screening all the deals in kind of end of 2016, early 2017, when the Delaware Basin, which is part of the Permian Basin, was really going crazy. So I did that for a fair number of months and then uh, opted to move out of Anadarko. I moved over to a private equity and cap backed portfolio company called Plantation, which was on its fifth iteration. Uh, I was really my first exposure to conventional oil and gas in the Midland Basin. We also drilled some pseudo conventionals in the horizontal San Andres, which was also interesting. When I got there, the company was, you know, starting to kind of like get a little long in the tooth with its uh, with its money from NCAP. And so eventually the the COO from that company then became the CEO of the company that I went to start called Sable Bay Exploration. At Sable Bay, we raised about half a billion dollars from NCAP to go explore. We really had uh, carte blanche to go anywhere in the United States, which, of course, is kind of a bad thing ultimately, because as a geologist, I wanna look at lots of different things. And so we had a couple of different ideas and ultimately we couldn't really decide what we wanted to go do. So I left the company and I went to teach for a little while. I did some coaching for younger geologists on how to pick logs, how to uh, you know make maps and things like that, which was one of my favorite things I've ever done, but ultimately ended up uh, going out and raising capital from another private equity backed or private equity company in Houston called Juniper Capital. I raised almost a hundred million dollars to go explore for horizontal Turner potential in the Powder River Basin, which was interesting because most of the company's PEs at that time were not allocating capital toward more exploratory projects. So I was very lucky. Um, started the company. We closed on our asset, began drilling, closed on our deal terms with Juniper all on the same day, which was a very interesting experience. Um, drilled some wells, were fairly successful. We did find oil. It wasn't, you know, anything special or to write home about. But what was interesting is that when Joe Biden got elected a few years later, most of our land was controlled by the federal government, about 98 percent of it. And so it became obvious that that just wasn't going to work out. Um, typically in the, those sorts of situations, you want to drill a test well, then you drill a few follow on wells to prove up the concept, and then you start a development plan. And so when it, it became clear that we weren't going to be able to execute either a delineation or a development plan, I started to kind of think about what I was doing. And I had run into the principles of energy funders about two years prior to that. And we'd been chatting about ways to work together, how things might look. And, and they actually called me that day and said, hey, we understand that you're mostly fed acreage. Would you like to come over to Energy Funders and run the company? So at that point, I decided I would make the shift, um, came over to Energy Funders in early 2021. Um, Ginny had already been here for what, a couple months, I believe. Um, and so I already had a fabulous teammate ready to go. Um, and yeah, we've been running the show ever since it, of course, you know, was my first opportunity running a fund like this, but I have had experience managing portfolios. So ultimately it's more or less the same thing. It's just where the money's coming from is an additional kind of nuance that I had never experienced before. So, um, it's been a really good experience here at energy funders. I think that Ginny and I have learned a lot in our two and a half, uh, almost three years together, kind of running EF and, we have a really solid idea of where we want to take the company now. We we did before and we were very successful in our first couple of funds, but now we have a more clear idea of, I think, what the investors actually want and what they're looking for. And we also have an excellent um, network for deals now that we had before, but we were kind of unwilling to test out until very recently. So we've got excellent deal flow. We're really excited about some of the things we've been seeing lately. and. Yeah, I think that's probably good for me. Ginny, do you want to go give your background? Sure, happy to. Yes, I'm Ginny Light. I'm the Vice President of Reservoir Engineering and Regulatory Affairs. Um, got my undergraduate degree in Petroleum Engineering at Texas A&M. Um, and that engineering, especially, I think, at Texas A&M is super math and science focused. And I felt like I needed a little more well-rounded education. Um, I, I was a dancer. I got a dance minor. And so kind of, kind of felt like I needed a little more, a little something else um, in my life. So I went went to law school, um, passed the bar, practiced law for a little while as an oil, oil and gas title attorney, um, and then had an opportunity to work as a reservoir engineer for DeGaulle and McNaughton in their um, Central Europe and Asia division, aka the, the Russian division. 
So I worked there for a number of years, um, pr primarily doing reserves audits in, in, um, for assets in Western Siberia. Um, then went to work for a family owned company in Dallas. Um, Primarily, my, my experience at, at DNM was mostly un, uh, mostly conventional assets. Um, when when I went to work for the family-owned company, we were primarily working unconventional assets, um, largely in the scoop stack merge area in Oklahoma and the Williston Basin. Um, then, so worked worked there for several several years. Um, then was chatting with one of our one of Energy Funders principals one day and. They actually, I, the um, guy who actually gave me one of my or my very first oil and gas internship back when I was a, a, a baby engineer, um, they and they needed a, a reservoir engineer as well as an attorney, and so here I am. So kind of it's kind of the perfect perfect position for me because I'm wearing both hats on any given day. And something I want to kind of hop in and highlight is that you know mm -hmm. what's particularly interesting about your experience at DNM is that they're well known in the industry for being very conservative in their reserves analysis. So for in our investors in particular, this is very beneficial because when we make deals, we only make deals if we can get them at Ginny's most conservative estimates, <laughs> which is exactly what do we call them? Well, double, my double black diamond. Your double black diamond, Ginny. <laughs> exactly. Awesome. Thank you, Ginny. And finally, yeah. Mr. Jeff. My name is Jeff Bryans. Um, I've really, um, the newest member of the team here, uh, came on a, a couple months ago. Um, I've really built my career at the intersection of finance and technology, though I do have um, many years of oil and gas experience uh, dating back to when I uh, met Laura at Williams. So uh, yeah, started my career in EMP. Um, I do have a degree from the University of Colorado in business and finance. Um, from there, I ended up going a more traditional finance route, though it was in the startup space. Um, I worked for a company called Street Account uh, that was later bought by uh, FactSet. So it was a great startup experience growing a company from um, not that many subscribers to uh, being acquired by a, uh, an S&P 500 company and then working for, for them for, for a number of years. Um, it allowed me to see financial markets from a number of different perspectives uh, and through a number of different lenses. Um, from there, I, I did um, uh, play around in, in, in the technology space on my own, uh, built a small company in the outdoor space, sold that, and uh, eventually got picked up um, by a private fund uh, marketplace company um, that was teal backed. Uh, this was in 2021, I guess. Um, that company, unfortunately, um, didn't make it like a number of venture back companies finding their demise and uh, uh, ended up here at Energy Funders. Um, that said, it was it, it's been a great and, and, and really um, fruitful ride from an experience perspective. Like I said, blending both financial markets and technology into, um, like I said, uh, uh, the career that I've built thus far. And um, I see a lot of um, really interesting opportunity for energy funders in the broader ecosystem. And that's what has drawn me to this company. Um, I think there is a, a, a lot of, to use the nerdy finance term alpha to be generated here. And having Laura and Ginny um, truly as a, 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 an in-house vertically integrated, uh, you know, geology engineering team, be able to go really uh, diligence and understand the deals that are out there on the private market side, I think sets ourselves up to be really successful as we look to the future, especially in an environment and a, a you know, against the financial markets backdrop that is anything but certain. You know, if there's one thing I think we can all agree on, it's that the world we live in um, is the way it is because of energy. And energy will be a an absolutely necessary part of whatever direction the world goes over the next you know, 5, 10, 20, 50 years. And there's no substitute for the high, highly dense and highly transportable and usable form of energy known as oil and gas. So, you know, as much of the world has maybe gone a different direction, or at least the financial world, this sets ourselves up to be really successful. So with that, Laura, I give it back to you. Now that you've met the awesome. team, one of the things that a lot of our prospective investors ask quite often is, 
what even is energy funders? What do we do and, and what is the real purpose of us in the marketplace? Energy Funders was founded in 2013 by two real estate attorneys who had seen the success of other alternative investment platforms like real estate, uh, sorry, Realty Mogul and Cadre and Yield Street. They thought, well, if you can do this with this alternative asset class, this class being real estate, you should be able to do it with another asset class. And these guys lived in Houston. And so they kind of thought, well, we live in Houston. There's oil and gas everywhere. We should go out and do this for oil and gas. So they started raising capital in 2015. Um, between 2015 and 2020, they were successful in raising, I think it was close to uh, somewhere between 17 and $20 million for individual uh, oil and gas wells. So, uh, which was great. Um, they had about the success rate that a well-educated geologist would expect, which means that about 30% of the wells that they were drilling were successful. Um, of that 30%, probably only 10% were actually economic, but to their credit, that is literally the potential success rate of a wildcat well. They were primarily drilling wildcat wells, which are these wells that don't have a lot of data associated with them. They are in new basins or basins with not a lot of other production. And so you kind of expect that that's sort of the, the anticipated rate. Now, when Energy Funders was purchased in 2020 by our now principal investors, um, they are old school oil and gas independents, and they have been running their own oil and gas company for close to 20 years. So what they noticed was that this was a great idea. I mean, there's absolutely a market for the product that we're selling. Um, a lot of investors have left the uh, public markets, of course, for due to ESG concerns or concerns about um, um, other people coming into companies such as Exxon and, and making big changes to Exxon. Um, there isn't really another opportunity for investors to come in unless you know kind of a rich good old boy down the street who has oil and gas assets. And so this is really the only opportunity for investors to come into oil and gas separate from being an investor in the general market or knowing a good old boy. So they recognize the, the, um, the option in the market for having this work. However, the way that it had currently been structured or had been structured for five years was highly risky and not something that most investors would stick with for a long time. I mean, if I put money into something and I get no return, if it's a dry hole, literally, then I'm probably not going to come back and give more money, even though from a statistical standpoint, that is how you should approach oil and gas. And so when they came in, we decided that we would shift the model toward more of what I was suggesting, which is more of a mutual fund type of model. If you have a portfolio of 10 wells, and let's say they're conventional, so you get one or two dry holes, then all of a sudden the, the concentration risk of that single dry hole blowing up your entire portfolio is significantly less. And so we shifted the way that we do business. We are moving in more of a, um, a uh, quantity of course, we are very focused on quality as well, but we're moving into a higher quantity and lower risk profile well. Currently we have, well, let me back up. Prior to this current fundraise, we had merged two different risk profiles. We had merged PUDs and PDP. PDP is wells that are already producing. PUDs are low risk wells that are offsetting something that already has production, but they're being drilled new. Right, so you're going out and drilling about a mile away from another well that's already produced out of formation. We had blended those together and the feedback from our investors was such that they would really prefer that those two kind of risk profiles were separate. And so our first flagship yield fund one product was a blended fund, but we discovered that most of our investors were interested in two things. One thing was tax benefits associated with drilling um, new oil and gas wells, our PUD fund. And the other thing was income from producing wells. We are now having a PD, PDP or production fund as well. And so instead of having those two things blended together, we're splitting them into different risk profile classes. However, our approach to those two still remains the same. We still approach them as we need to put you know, 10 plus wells in each of those portfolios to decrease the concentration risk if something bad does happen on one of the wells. Of course, oil and gas is one of the riskiest businesses that you can have. Um, you know, you run the risk of having commodity cycles blow up. You run the risk of having a well literally blow up. There's all these different things that play into it. And one of the things that I think Ginny and I in particular do well is select products, select assets that are as low risk as we can more or less possibly get while still maximizing the potential for returns. 
So Jeff, I think now would be a good time for you to talk about kind of how you see energy funders fitting into the broader alt investment landscape and maybe more of the macro perspective. Sure. Um, so yeah, as, as I alluded to, I, I came from a, a company that was all about private funds and really a marketplace for uh, emerging managers to be discovered. And, and you know, I'm a huge nerd for uh, really you know, identifying those funds that, that offer something, something special. And as, as Laura was talking about, when this company was founded, it was really akin to um, what you might see out there in the tech industry where you can go on like AngelList and invest in a startup. And the likelihood of you hitting "quote unquote" pay dirt on that startup's pretty low. And when you're when you're when you're out there doing kind of what what the original founders of energy funders were were, were offering, it was kind of that same thing. Like maybe you 10x your money, but probably you're going to find a zero. And and for certain investors, that's fine. Unfortunately, for most of your you know uh, Americans that want to find some return on their money, but they don't want to lose their money, that's not really the best model for a crowdfunding environment or really anybody out there looking to elicit a return. So when the, the new principles took over, they recognized that most investors out there are not going to be looking for this kind of risk profile. And they're not going to be able to allocate into a number of different wells on a platform. So as opposed to having the investor come in and pick you know, a number of different wells to arbitrarily invest their capital into, they started to bundle a more um, a, a less risky product altogether. And as Laura alluded to, this included both producing assets and new drill opportunities. Um, as time has gone on, we've recognized through our investor base that perhaps the better way to do this is to parse those two things uh, apart. So you've got your new drill opportunities, that's gonna be one fund in the form of like a PUD fund as we internally call it, or the preferred equity drilling fund as we formally call it. And then we have a PDP product. So that's going to be your producing wells that we're also buying separately, putting into a portfolio. And as opposed to having that one-off well risk, we're bundling these together. And through the portfolio, you're getting diversification. Through that diversification, you're mitigating a lot of your risk. So this is a lot of what we're doing now. And, and as a result of this, we've really gone from a crowdfunding approach and, and this one-off type of thing to being more of a, of a, of a product that is more akin to um, private equity, um, in which we're actually bundling together a number of assets. And then we're going out into the market and saying, hey, this is the portfolio. This is the fund we've built. Would you like to invest in it? So it's no longer this roulette wheel. It's it's a different type of risk that you're taking. And it should be a more durable, uh, a more uh, um, sustainable type of return for our shareholders. And this is something that you know I think uh, is, is most exciting for me because Unlike what you might see in the public markets where there's a lot of noise, you're not just investing in a particular field or a particular asset. There's also just a lot of intrinsic risk in the publicly traded markets. Here, you're getting more direct access to oil and gas investing. And in this current environment where, like I said, there's there's never been more demand for oil and gas, this is a compelling way to let people invest. Plus, as we're going to talk about later, there, there are great tax advantages that you really only can get through private market investing. So for all of these reasons, you know, we've really you know, transitioned the company from more of a risky crowdfunding thing, more of a roulette wheel, to a real durable you know, uh, uh, product that anybody that um, wants oil and gas in their portfolio might find to be really, really useful um, you know, uh, in their broader um, investing background. And team, we have prospective investors asking us all the time, maybe they're unfamiliar with investing in energy or oil and gas in general. What are some of the benefits of investing in oil and gas? Why would someone choose that? We touched on it a little bit, but why would someone choose that over investing in the S&P 500, for example? Um, it's a great question, Sage. Um, there's a number of reasons that somebody might want to add or include private market oil and gas in their portfolio. Now, Nobody on this webinar here is suggesting you take all the money you've got and invest it all into oil and gas. Diversification is a really good idea. Now, we're not your professional wealth advisors or investment advisors. We always suggest you run any idea that you hear by them. You know, None of this is investment advice. It's for educational purposes only. However, um, the reason you might want to consider uh, a private market oil and gas portfolio, uh, or there, there's a number of reasons. First reason is one of the greatest drivers uh, 
toward inflation, it has always been energy. It's always been a, a, a mark um, that everybody in finance pays attention to if, if oil and gas prices are going up, especially gas prices, which as you can you know, go read in any uh, financial publication right now, they are rising. Uh, that's an indication that inflation has not uh, been um, completely quelled by the Fed, which I think we can all agree has not been completely tamed. This is why rates continue to stay high. This is why um, you know people are feeling it at the pump. And frankly, this is a great reason to invest. Wouldn't it be great to be on the other side of the pump when you're when you're filling up your truck or or whatever? So this is a way to mitigate uh, against some form of inflation. It's also got incredible tax benefits, which I'm going to let Laura and Ginny talk about here in a second, um, especially on the new drill opportunity side. Um, and then there is the, like I was alluding to, there's the um, there's a there's a correlation um, to the public market, sure, but we are not as correlated to some of the um, underlying beta in the market. So what do I mean by beta? I just mean whatever the S&P 500 is doing, our assets sometimes are not as impacted by that. So if you're looking for a true alternative that gives you a return in an environment where maybe the S&P isn't doing what you want, this is a great opportunity for that. You know, So those are the three main reasons um, that I suggest you look at this. Of course, the fourth is, you know, again, as I alluded to, there, energy is what makes the world go round quite literally and our quality of life be what it is. It's not going away, no matter what anybody might say. So as a result of that, you know, it's a needed good. And because it's a needed good, there's generally quality, durable, uh, robust returns around that particular asset class. And I think we can all agree. I mean, it's coming up towards the end of the year. Tax benefits is something that's always on a lot of folks' mind this time of year. Laura, Ginny, what are some of the tax benefits that are inherent in oil and gas investing? So there's a couple different benefits. I'll, I'll start and Ginny, feel free to hop in here if you'd like to. Um, the benefits are associated with things called intangible drilling costs and intangible completion costs, which are basically things outside of physical objects that we're putting down the well bore. So like um, casing, for example, is tangible. You can literally see it. So any work that's done on the well, anything like that is tax deductible. Typically, when you go and drill a new well or are penetrating a new formation, so you can actually get tax deductions from entering an old well bore and perfing a new formation. It's just anytime there's new rock being exposed to produce, you can get tax benefits from the IDCs and ICCs. On a single well basis, this can make up, up to 70 to 95 percent typically on average of the well cost is tax deductible and that tax deduction gets passed down to our investors. So for example, let's say you put $50,000 into the fund and we go out and drill a well and your 50,000 is a part of the total 95% tax deduction, you know, 95% of your 50K will be tax deductible in the year that that well was drilled and completed. There's a lot of nuance to this, and actually the SEC rules around it are very, very strict, and we try our very, very hardest. In fact, I think we might be one of the only groups out there that actually adheres to all the rules, but we want to make sure that our investors are getting those tax deductions uh, in the year that they are available to the investor. The other tax benefit that we don't tout quite as much, but we probably should, is the, depre is the, de the depreciation tax deduction. It makes up about 15% of a well every single year. So even after you go drill the well and you get your 95% or 70% or whatever, in the years following that, you get a depreciation deduction as well that typically is about 15%. Did I get that right, Ginny? Anything to add? Yeah, yeah, we covered it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the tax benefits make up a significant part of the benefit of the fund, specifically to our preferred equity drilling fund. Now, the production fund, the PDP fund that we will have out pretty shortly here, uh, it has tax benefits. Again, it's that 15% de depreciation deduction, but it's not quite as significant. Now, the benefit to the PDP fund is you're getting cash flow every month from these producing wells. So it's a slightly lower risk profile, which is why the government has allocated higher tax deductions to going to drill a new well. Awesome. And I think we have time for one more question here today. A lot of things that folks ask about are around what makes us special? What makes energy funders different than some of the other operators out there? 
what are some of the things that we do that makes us a little bit different from the other folks that are out there? Well, this is one that I want the whole team to chime in on, but I will start. Um, I think what our quote unquote special sauce is, is that Ginny and I in particular, and of course, Jeff as well, have extensive experience and networks in oil and gas. When you go to some of our competitors and invest with them, they typically are partnering with one group in one basin. And typically those groups are Exxon, Chevron, XTO, EOG, big, big companies. And so you'll get exposure to 10 well bores in, let's call it the Permian Basin or North Dakota in the Bakken formation or something like that. Ginny and I pride ourselves on our, our networks and our ability to select actionable oil and gas assets, uh, trades. There are a lot of people out here who are independent operators who have amazing assets that need a little bit of help to go drill things. You know, we're not partnering with majors. In fact, we're trying to more or less prop up the, let's just use South Texas where, where we live and, and typically operate as an example. We're trying to help prop up these independent operators who have been out here for sometimes upwards of 50, 60 years and improve the, the ability of those operators to go and drill select properties. Now, I will say it's difficult to dig up enough properties. Uh, recently, we've come across several unconventional or horizontal properties, but again, these are independent operators. These aren't majors who, it's, it's well known that their majors are very difficult to cut a good deal with. And so often when you, when you work with independent operators, they're much more um, uh, amicable or approachable when it comes to deal terms. And if there is enough meat to be had on the bone, which is what we're obviously looking for, we want our investors to get as much as they can and leave some on the bone for the, uh, the operator as well. So I think that's one of the things. There's several other things. Ginny, I'll let you, uh, I'll let you speak now. Sure. I've, I've got a siren situation out here, so I hope it's not <laughs> too distracting. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I would also say that we, Laura's a geologist, I'm, I'm a re reservoir engineer, we have all of this in house, which I think is unique to our, our team and um, to our company. Not not every um, group like ours has that. So and also investors can go online and make their investments online in a streamlined process which i think is huge and really differentiates us from other from other groups yeah the other thing is that we we try really hard to not have ex over exposure to one basin or another i think that this is something that you know of course as Ginny just alluded to, we're both uh, technical backgrounds and we pay attention to what's happening in the broader market specific to oil and gas. And so what we try to do is not only select the best properties, but also select the best areas to be in for, for economic advantage, I suppose is really the right way to say it. Are the deals actionable? Are the deals gonna make our investors money? Uh, what is the break even oil price in each basin? Is there even the ability to get into said basin? So for example, I know I've mentioned the Delaware Basin before. The Delaware Basin is notoriously difficult to get into right now because the cost to purchase acreage, which we don't do, but the cost to purchase acreage is so prohibitively expensive that it's very difficult to justify the current economics. So to get into a project in the Delaware, you have to pay up to be a part of that. Now, down here in South Texas, it's sort of forgotten, frankly, break-evens are not very high. They're relatively low uh, compared to some of the other basins. Um, and no one has really been down here operating in a, in a major way with the exception, of course, the Eagleford and the Austin Chalk, but there's a lot of other formations, basins, things like that uh, happening down here. They're really compelling from, a, from an economic perspective and from an operational perspective, you know, lower risk, uh, shallower wells, um, higher producibility. So, you know, we do really leverage our technical background and expertise into the deals that we're selecting. And the other thing is that Ginny and I are, I don't want to brag, but you know, this is a, a sales pitch. Um, but we are exceptionally fast at what we do. That was one of the things that always set me apart from my peers at the companies I've worked at is, is speed of evaluation. We've been doing this. I mean, I could, I could do this in my sleep, basically. I know Ginny can because she basically has. Um, <laughs> we can evaluate any given deal in probably a matter of days, which, which really does set us apart when I work in private equity. You know, it could take PE shops months to diligence deals. 
you know, Ginny and I have experience with a variety of different people, which is also very helpful because one of the things that we haven't really addressed is the relationship that you have with the counterparty that you're negotiating with. If you have a good relationship with a counterparty and you're able to come to terms faster, obviously that's going to be beneficial. Ginny and I really primarily try to focus on counterparties who we either already know have a great reputation and have uh, and, and specifically operational reputation. So not only do they have a good reputation in the industry itself, but also from an operational perspective, fewer spills, you know, their regulatory compliance, all of those sorts of things play a significant role in our evaluation, which is notoriously very quick. Yeah, the, the, Sage, it's a good question. There's a number of ways that I think this company differentiates itself, not just from the peers in oil and gas, but just broadly speaking in alternative investing. You know, Ginny hit one of the things, which is um, we have a platform that allows you to quickly invest and it allows for us to distribute back without it being this huge, um, you know, paper trail type of thing. So, you know, the efficiency that, that you're able to invest in and, and the, the way we leverage technology to just make this way more streamlined, that's a huge tailwind that we that we drive. Um, the other thing, as we all touched on, is we're vertically integrated. We have everything in-house that we need to do or we, we, we need to get these deals done in a measurable process oriented way. And those are the other two things I really wanted to talk about is we are process oriented. We do measure everything we do and we're getting a lot better. So we've got a number of years, you know, collectively as a team that we're all leaning into to do what we're going to do into the future in the best way we possibly can. And that, that, um, that obsession with doing it the best we possibly can and refining our processes, that's something that really sets us apart. Now, the final thing that I think is really interesting, as Laura alluded to, is, you know, we're aiming at private market deals that are, frankly, hard to find. And the network that Ginny and Laura bring to the table, it's akin to what you might have seen in venture capital in the early 90s. You know, nobody could break into venture capital, frankly, because nobody had the network in Silicon Valley to do it. Nobody knew where the next Microsoft was going to come come up from because nobody knew who that was. You needed to be there. You need to be on the ground. You needed to be in the area in which the assets are actually being allocated into. And on that note, this is the real opportunity I think we've got is if you are an independent oil and gas operator in South Texas, in you name the basin, it doesn't really matter. If you're an independent and you need capital right now, you're really in a tough spot. You can't go to a bank. Banks really aren't lending. What are you going to do? Go to the public markets and IPO your really tiny company? That's not going to work. So we're in a situation where we provide liquidity to these operators that have great deals that desperately need us to come in to allocate into the deals, let them operate. Um, and we're able to elicit a great return. It's a great partnership between the operator and us. And as I, you know, as a, as we've talked about, you know, ad nauseum at this point, oil and gas is vital to this country, to the world we live, to the quality of life we have. So these independents are incredibly you know, important in that you know, chain, and we're able to kind of keep them alive through what we do. So it's, it's not just something that we think there's great financial returns on, blah, blah, blah. We actually think this is something that's quite needed, you know, what we do. It's, it's important um, to keep you know, the type of things we all love moving. You know, energy is behind all of that. So, so that's really what makes us special, I think, is all of those things wrapped together um, you know, off into the future. Wonderful. And that's all the time we have for questions today, but stay tuned. We're going to make this a regular webinar series. Really appreciate your time and attention today. Ginny, Laura, Jeff, as always, we appreciate it and stay tuned for another webinar. Great. Thank you, Sage.